Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, welcome to the first edition of the Black Research Network Speaker Series. We're happy to have you here. My name is Maria Williams, and I'm the program lead for the Black Research Network, a strategic initiative established by the University of Toronto to promote black research excellence at the university and also to enhance the capacity of sc black scholars um, on the world stage. Today, we have our guest speaker, William Paris, an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy, and our moderator, Rinaldo Walcott, an associate professor at the Ontario Institute of Studies in Education, and he's also the director of Women and Gender Studies Institute. Just before we get into the event itself, I'd like us to take a minute to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Some quick housekeeping. This event is being live streamed, and so we'll appreciate if you could put your phones on silent mode just to avoid any disruptions or distractions during the event. And if you need to use the washroom, it's right upstairs. If you, to my, if you go out this door to my left, just go up the stairs and the washroom is right at the top of the stairs. And then the format for today's event, we'll be having a presentation by our guest speaker, William Paris, followed by a dialogue between himself and Ronaldo Walcott, our moderator. After this, we'll have a Q&A with the audience. Please feel free to prepare your questions ahead, and once we get to that point, we'll ask you to um, share your questions. And if you're joining us on the live stream, please feel free to drop your questions at any point in time in the chat. It's my privilege to introduce our moderator today, Ronaldo Walcott. Ronaldo is a writer, a cultural critic, and a full professor in the Women and Gender Studies Institute. He is also a member of the graduate program at the Institute of Cinema Studies at the University of Toronto. He held the Canada Research Chair of Social Justice and Cultural Studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education from 2002 to 2007. Ronaldo is the author of the book titled Black Like Who? Writing Black Canada and co-author of Black Life Post BLM and the Struggle for Freedom. Renato's teaching and research is in the area of Black Diaspora Cultural Studies and Post-Colonial Studies, with an emphasis on questions of sexuality, gender, nation, citizenship, and multiculturalism. As an interdisciplinary Black Studies scholar, Ronaldo has published in a wide range of, of venues. His articles have appeared in journals and books, as well as popular multimedia platforms. I'll now hand over to Ronaldo to introduce our guest speaker for today and get us started. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. And I'm, I'm glad we got to the right bio because I was getting nervous. I was like, my colleague Alyssa Truss, who's the director of Women and Gender Studies, is not going to be happy with me. <laughs> but it's, thank you for coming out this afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce my colleague, um, William Paris, who I'm getting to meet in the flesh for the first time today. So William Paris is an assistant professor in philosophy here at the University of Toronto. He's also the associate editor for the journal Critical Philosophy of Race. His research focuses on the history of African-American philosophy, 20th century continental philosophy, and political philosophy. He has published on Franz Fanon, and gender, Sylvia Winters, Phenomenology of Imagination, and C.L.R. James and Hannah Arendt. Racial Justice and Forms of Life, Towards a Critical Theory of Utopia, 
argues that contemporary notions of racial justice that equate freedom with liberal egalitarianism are unable to address the systemic dysfunctions of life under capitalism. Theoretical projects of racial justice are often concerned with the problem of rights and recognition, and this tends to assume that states in their current form are the horizon of politics. What is missing is the question of whether states in principle can arrest, can arrest the racial disadvantages of environmental precarity, economic dislocation, and police violence that tend to accrue in capitalist forms of life. By conjoining philosophy, historical black studies, and social theory, William Paris contends we can capture a vision of an alternate form of life where states are no longer dependent on capitalist markets. This vision elucidates new forms of consciousness, legality, and social power that moves beyond the current limits of social justice. A critical theory of utopia brings into relief, brings into relief the limits of racial justice on the societies oriented towards the expansion of capital rather than, rather than, did I read the wrong thing? No, no. rather than the ends of social freedom. So the main, this is the main concern, the main concern of the book that William is working on um, is that programs of racial justice that do not attend to our form, of, our form of life fail to explain why so many movements of racial justice fall short and will tend to naturalize aspects of our social life can be transformed. Racial justice and forms of life will elucidate why we should expand the version of racial justice beyond dependency. Sorry, now it's not moving. Beyond dependency on states and bureaucracies and move toward recognizing the fundamental cultural, political, and economic patterns that make up our form of life. And we're going to hear a bit of what William is doing in this book from this talk this afternoon. So please welcome Professor William Paris. Uh, I promise to keep my comments to 30 minutes, so you'll see me set up my phone, and I will obey the technology. <laughs> uh, I want to begin by thanking the Black Research Network, Beth and Mariah, for inviting me to give uh, the, first, uh, the first talk uh, in this series. And I look forward to having a discussion with you about some of the ideas I'm going to put forward here. So I actually have a longer talk, so I'll read from some of it, but I think it helps to, for me to just give you a general understanding of where this talk is coming from to set the basis for the conversation. So James Boggs, in uh, his, his famous text, um, for those of you who don't know James Boggs, he worked in um, uh, the auto unions in Detroit in 1970 and 1980. He's what's known as an organic intellectual. He wasn't you know, uh, professionally trained in universities, but you know, he was trained in the, the work of the labor movement, reading groups, and I think he's just as much of a philosopher as anybody um, that you know, you'll encounter in normal courses. In uh, uh, the American Workers' Notebooks, he has this line that you know, uh, stunned me. Rights are what you make and what you take. And you know, this line you know, stuck with me because you know, I found myself asking, what is it that we think rights do for us when we live in political society? You know, rights is the language that most of us use to make sort of moral claims about what ought not to be the case or what ought to be the case, what others should not be able to do to me, what I should be able to do. But I think what he started to realize is, if you think the substance of rights are simply what institutions grant you, then you're missing that what makes a right, a right salient, what makes it um, something real that actually says something about what you can do in a social life, you must have power behind it. And what he worries is that most of us have taken rights as simply a moral vocabulary rather than also a critique of the institutions that guarantee social relationships, that guarantee that we can be treated uh, in one way or another. And so I want to begin and kind of like, you know, um, this is probably going to be the most pessimistic part of the talk. So get ready. I know. I'm the utopia guy, but, you know, I'm a sober utopian. You know, part of what, you know, what you know, animates what I'm thinking here is you know, uh, watching the video of George Floyd. 
and you know the police officer killing him as you know, you know he cried out for help get off and it isn't even like he was alone in that street people were filming but you know it seemed what way could we say Floyd had rights and I know what my friends who um, I don't want to be too snarky uh, I know what my friends who will say the system works will say, which is like, well, that police officer, he was arrested and convicted, so I guess, you know, retrospectively, we can say that George Floyd's rights were violated. But, you know, for me, I think, you know, that's a bit too little too late, and it, under, it misunderstands the stakes of what's going on there, which is, why did the police officer have the capacity to do that to him? And it wasn't simply that police officer, it's the institution of the police that it turns out that you can have rights, but when it comes to the force of law, those rights are not, you know, they are not worth the paper that they are printed on. And so we should be asking, is all we want from rights the ability to say retrospectively that a harm was committed? Now let me get even bleaker for a second. Uh, apparently in March, the IPC, IPCC um, released a report saying somewhere around 700 million Africans will be displaced by climate change by 2030. Let's really real with you. We all talk about human rights. We all talk about the idea that we all know that we're do certain things. Those rights will be worth nothing in the face of that type of migration. We are already seeing European countries, Western countries militarizing their borders, militarizing the idea of leaving migrants out to die, whether it's at sea, in the desert. The UK had this crazy plan, I guess, of shipping people, no matter where they came from, back to Rwanda. We are not ready for what type of world that will, will be. Um, uh, and if we only use this language of rights, we'll continue to misunderstand why we lack the effective control to actually give people the world that they deserve. And so if we continue with this language of rights, you know, to, let, let me try to move out of the bleakness for a second. I think what Boggs is seeing um, when he's writing about black power in, 19, in, 19, in the 1970s is, He's realizing that the concept of rights is under crisis. One is becoming un less and less clear what moral work rights are supposed to do. But two, and I think those who are watching this from the United States, you might know a little bit about this, our institutions that are supposed to guarantee rights are increasingly under both a legitimacy crises and practical crises of effectivity. But if we have no other horizon of, did I even start my clock? Yes, I did, okay, good. <laughs> but if we have no other horizon for talking about these social problems, we'll find ourselves constantly deadlocked, looking for, to the state to do something that I think Boggs was eventually realizing it fundamentally cannot do. And so unfortunately, so much of rights has become about winning hearts and minds, winning the recognition of these institutions, but we're not asking whether these institutions, you know, what types of rights are they guaranteeing? And to kind of give you the Cliff Notes version, and then I'll go to my, my proper notes, what Boggs realizes is the rights that we got are a distinctly capitalist form of rights. They are the right to enter the labor market. They're certainly not a right to get a job, but they're the right to take your chance on the labor market. So this, for him, means that the social relations that we live under will form the types of rights that we have. And if we want more effective rights, will probably need you know, a different set of social relations. And for him, that means no longer being dependent on the market, no longer having a state that you know, um, cannot even control market forces such as deindustrialization, uh, competition, et cetera. So I hope that you know, gives you a kind of um, uh, a sort of uh, vision of why I think that this is important. That I want to go back to Boggs because this is a very particular moment where I think you know, Ronaldo and I will talk about this, you know, rightly or wrongly, he thought that there was a moment to mobilize the language of rights for a different set of social relations. History makes fools of all of us. That did not come. But I still think that there's something there to give us some concrete language, a vision of you know, the type of theory that we need that won't um, trap us in this sort of liberal capitalist horizon that will continually not understand the systemic problems under which we live. The question of black power referred to in the title of the paper is what was black power? From the end of the civil rights movement to the beginning of the 1980s, James Bogg set about the task of investigating black power as a scientific concept rather than a metaphor or a mode of slogan. 
For a political concept to be scientific, for James Boggs, it had to be self-consciously rooted in the existing social forces and dynamics, um, in the existing social forces and dynamics, as well as composed of clear strategies a social group could appeal to in their struggle for self-emancipation. Boggs insisted that black power attained salience in the aftermath of the successes of the civil rights movement because it was only with formal integration to the circuits of American democracy and capitalism would the limitations of social recognition become apparent. Boggs' thesis was that civil rights and social power were distinct, and the group that confuses the, uh, the latter, social power for the former civil rights, was liable to lose both. So I, again, I also think an important insight of Boggs that um, I hope to elaborate in the conversation and further is that if you don't have power, for Boggs, functionally speaking, you do not have rights. And so what I also think is important about what Boggs will say, and I'm, I'm cliff noting some parts of this talk, is that for, right, for Boggs, rights are not a moral concept. When I say that they're a scientific concept for Boggs, he means either you have them or you don't. And you know you have them if you are able to defend them and protect them. If you need to depend on others to simply either out of their goodwill or out of some tradition to recognize your rights, if to go further back into the African American tradition to someone like Martin Delaney, um, a black nationalist before the Civil War, he'll say, you don't have rights, you have privileges. You have something that hinges on others being willing to grant you that, but you will always be under the dominion of what if they change their minds. And Boggs thinks you lose sight of that if you think that simply you know, the signing of a of piece of legislation or, as I'll say later in this talk, the Supreme Court um, and their decision of Brown v. the Board of Education, if you see them as giving you rights, for him he'll say, all they did is set the stage for us to struggle for what is our due. My contention is that we currently live in a moment where we can no longer ask what black power is because, at least as Boggs understood the concept, it no longer exists and social theory should ask why. My short reflections are a part of my larger book project, as Ronaldo said, so I don't have the space to go into all the aspects of what I think social transformation from a black perspective requires and why it has been hampered. I'm willing to talk about this in the conversation. Instead, my more limited goal here is to outline what it would mean to say that black power no longer exists. I think James Boggs provides fruitful resources that challenge some of the main lines of political analysis that take the measure of black power to be the, to the, the extent to which certain blacks can influence cultural representation or influence others in power to produce policies that supposedly favor black people. Just let me step back again what I mean here. Power is not being able to whisper, whisper into the ears of the powerful and hope that you can guide their decision making. If we're talking about self-determination, which Boggs thought was key to the labor unions, I won't be able to get to this point in the talk, but he thinks one of the mistakes that happened for um, the labor movement in the 1930s and 1940s is they ceded political power, political control over production in favor of management raising wages. And it turns out that's a great deal in the short term, but it creates all these problems of you're still dependent on management, you're still dependent on this alien force. And so sometimes I think, sometimes I hear, you know, the dialogue of what's important is about being in the room with power rather than having power. And I think that's absolutely insufficient. Sorry, I guess I'm militant today. <laughs> For Boggs, neither of these options is an indicator of power and is worth specifying why. To do so, I will define Boggs' idiosyncratic understanding of what it means to have a right. I'll talk a little bit about how are mobilized, uh, and then I'll conclude by showing how for Boggs a right presupposes power rather than vice versa. Rights and the curious question of power. What have black people been struggling for when they've struggled for rights? Naturally, the answers will vary in, every, any, in any given time period or organization, but I think we can say that the struggle for rights entails two distinct yet connected claims. First, there's the assertion of a moral claim or framework. The enslaved or the racially dominated are saying, I ought not to be treated in such and such a manner and you ought to recognize that. So to assert a right is to make a particular type of moral demand on another person or an institution. When blacks made the claim that they had the right to their bodily autonomy, to the security of their families, to the right to vote, they are drawing a border between themselves and what others may do to them. But the moral claim for recognition does not suffice for guaranteeing a truly effective right. And so second, blacks who have struggled for their rights have also fought for a set of social relations that would institutionalize their moral claims. 
The struggle for rights has often been attended by a struggle to bring into existence a set of institutions or legal frameworks that would standardize these moral claims. Fighting for the end of slavery in the United States was substantially more than a fight to get whites to agree that blacks are human beings. It was a fight to constrain what whites could do to black people by transforming their humanity, by, by transforming black people's humanity into legally recognized. The normative source of rights is pre-social. I won't have time to get to that talk, but I do not think that they are. I think that rights are rooted in the scene of political struggle. Again, it's a convenient story to make rights pre-social because it can be, it turns out nothing can take away your rights. And then we have to explain, I can't, why can't I control what people can do to me or, or to my social group? I think we can agree that rights are only effective insofar as they are grounded upon a definite set of social relations. In liberal democracies, rights are articulated as the contractual relationship between persons and the state. Many, but by no means all, black struggles have focused on the social relations that define the state and its legal frameworks. The, the civil rights movement, was a, that was a big part of trying to say that you know, we are also citizens. We also have duties that the state ought to recognize um, that other citizens have. They've often appealed to the moral and legal frameworks of the state in order to expand the sphere of personhood to include black human beings. Just real quick, for those who don't know, the reason why I say personhood and human beings is because I grant that black people are human beings. That is different than having the status of personhood, which is a contractual relationship that emerges from, from rights in a legal framework. Now, this strategy does make sense. If persons cannot be held in bondage, because of the rights the state is obligated to recognize, the recognitions of blacks as persons would likely entail the abolition of slavery. If only in a much different world at the, at the moment. Those of us who are minimally familiar with the history of black struggles in the US or anti-colonial struggles around the world know that the state can abide by logical contradictions for long periods of time. There is a, yes, that was a joke. Thank you, whoever <laughs> laughed. There is a yawning gap between legal freedom and real freedom. What is, of course, missing is some account of the powers that ensure that the state lives up to its obligations. Neither states nor social systems have consciences, since they are nothing more than bundles of bureaucracies and institutions staffed by innumerable individuals. So the power that we are looking for cannot be moral suasion. This is really important to me. I do think it's, it makes sense to talk about things like you know, structural racism. I do think it makes sense to talk about racial capitalism. I do not think it makes sense to moralize that as if we can convince something like capitalism to no longer be racist, if we get to read more Frederick Douglass or something. I think you know, what all Boggs is also seeing is that these are social relations that have you know, um, objective patterns and forces to them, and that you know, when you're looking at things like markets and states, these are the responses and accumulations of innumerable actions from individuals who may or may not be coordinating, though the powerful, they tend to have more resources to coordinate. In other words, I also want to say that this is a very complicated problem. And if it were only the case of trying to turn the soul towards the good, I think, again, this world would be in a much cleaner place. OK. Uh, this good? I find this gap between legal recognition and real freedom curious because if we consider what rights are, at least in much of the liberal tradition, we find that the contractual relationship that defines rights has less to do with empowering individuals than disempowering what others may do to an individual or a group. For instance, you have a right not to be barred from entering into a wage contract of your choosing with an employer, and there are actions an employer may not take against you. You are not empowered to have a wage contract if no one is hiring. I hope to convince you that this distinction between empowerment to and disempowerment from is crucial for James Boggs. The issue is that the enforcement mechanism that ensures that others are sufficiently disempowered in what they can do due to us is often assumed. The, the enforcement mechanism is the courts. Failing that, we can look to either periodic elections or civil disobedience all routes seem to run through the state. 
But what use is a right if the state won't or can't uphold their end of the contract? I also wrote this in the aftermath in the United States of the Supreme Court overturning Roe. So there's another thing that I'm doing here, and I don't think I'm being too polemical. I, I do think that this is a coherent argument, but I can come across as polemical because I also think we, um, and by we, I mean not you in this room, I'm sure you all are aware of this, but I think many people still remember the Supreme Court simply in the imaginary of the civil rights movement, which was more of a brief moment when the Supreme Court wasn't, you know, acting as a political instrument of reaction and conservatism. And so this shock that the Supreme Court can also play politics, can also play a role in rolling back rights, I think we need to let go of that and understand that the Supreme Court is also within you know, the struggle for power, but also historically has usually played the role of conserving the state of affairs rather than um, emancipating or transforming it. So again, so part of this is ideology critique. We need to let some images go. If we recall that an effective right is not only a moral framework, but a set of institutionalized social relations, then we have to acknowledge that we cannot only focus on the state in order to understand rights. We have to grasp the institutionalized social relations that comprise markets, or what we innocently call the economy. We are not addressing ourselves to a state that exists outside time, but a definite form of the state that is constrained by the demands of free markets and the free flow of capital. So a right is not abstract, but takes a particular shape given the complex relationships between the state and the economy. Presently, states are called to establish a, a delicate balance between the political freedoms of citizens and the economic freedom of capitalist markets to invest and accumulate how they see fit. These two imperatives can and often do come into conflict when individuals claim a right to not simply be cut off from the means to life and capital claims a right to be able to move and reinvest. This is deeply important for Boggs, just you know, a reminder. He also, um, when he's in the Detroit Auto Union, what he sees coming is your know, mass deindustrialization of urban centers. And so what's fascinating for him is he develops an account of racial capitalism that isn't necessarily ideological racism and you know, um, the existence of race isn't necessarily explanatory, but given that many black people live in these cities and they will be the ones who are locked out of the labor market, race continues to exist without anybody having to have a racist thought in their mind. And so he sees automation coming, and this is not a moral problem. This is simply, you know, what the type of the right to creativity, to progress, to production is going to do. And he's going to say, what can we do in the midst of these social forces that are going to cut our legs out from under us? All of this is a long way of saying that the rights of political freedom are not necessarily commensurate with the rights of economic freedom. Many black struggles in the 19th and 20th century saw this problem and understood that political freedom was worth very little if they were less vulnerable to the impersonal dynamics of the economy. However, efforts to exert control over markets and capital were often met with vicious and deadly resistance as detailed by W.E.B. Du Bois and Black Reconstruction. Newly freed blacks in the South elected to government attempted to reorganize and redistribute the property relations that had been institutionalized and were met with violence and abandonment from Northern capitalists who wanted to ensure their own freedom, the freedom to invest, to accumulate. Blacks in the South discovered they lacked the requisite power to effectively claim what they took to be theirs by right. Now this brings us back to my question of what powers can obligate the state to live up to its obligations. Stephen Lukes in his book Power, A Radical View describes three dimensions to a sociological account of power. First, we can say that power is defined by who can exercise a required force in, de in decision-making context. In other words, whose preferences went out. In the historical example of Reconstruction, we can say that the preferences of the Northern capitalists won out when presented with the choice between black redistribution and white accumulation. Second, we can say that power is defined by who shapes what choices are taken to be salient in a given context. In the US, the fact that the major political decisions are often broken down into a choice between two political parties is not a natural occurrence, but an effect of powerful constraints. And third, power is defined by one party being able to extract the consent of another party. What's key for Luke's here is that we, are a, that we should be able to, this is the trickiest you know, um, notion of power because it requires us to be able to evaluate whether the dominated party would have chosen differently if they knew or had the capacity to choose other options. So there's the obvious power of who wins in the decision. 
there is the power of who gets to set the stage for what are the options on, on the table. And then there's the, the, the power to be able to create a context in which you choose, you seemingly choose choices that in the long run will probably undercut the, um, the autonomy and self-determination that you have. The questions of rights often obscures this third dimension of power since their enforcement mechanism is often taken for granted. Boggs' radical revision of rights is premised on his understanding that liberal rights are a form of integration into a set of social relations that artificially separate the state and the economy. Rights from within the social relations of the capitalist state will not empower blacks against the macro forces of deindustrialization and capital flight that lock them out of labor markets. If one can be ejected from the set of social relations, i.e. locked out of the labor market, then for Boggs, one does not have rights. You can still make moral claims, but all you can be for Boggs is an object of pity or charity. Boggs believes capitalist markets necessarily and systematically bar racialized populations from participating and thus disempower them even as they retain de jure political rights. He argues that black power should constitute a refusal to consent to this form of right. So um, I want to you know, pause here again. Um, because I won't be able to get to the section where Boggs talks about, you know, something that, you know, we need to systematically understand with the, the liberal form of rights is that the system that we live under systematically we know produces what he calls outsiders. What does he mean by outsiders? He means the ones who are unemployed, who have no access of even getting into the labor market. Now you might think, no, we, have, we don't live in that system. We live in a system of full employment. Well, we're living in a time, because of inflationary pressures, it turns out, Full unemployment is not actually what the doctor ordered. And so economic institutions like the Fed, national banks that don't quite seem to be vulnerable to democratic control will make decisions and say, actually, the unemployment rate needs to go up. And you know, what Boggs wants to say is, if our rights are you know, modeled on this idea of participating in the labor market and yet systematically produces those who will be locked out of it, then you should understand that that is a contradiction in the very form of right. And so what I think is important here is that I think a lot of people think left thinkers like Boggs, you know, because they have a problem with the state, that means that they have a problem with rights. That's not it. Instead, what they want is you know, a set of institutions that allows for a different form of rights that don't entail a necessary exclusion of millions of people. I am reminded but, um, of this you know, but, um, the, from this idea of you know, refusing to consent to this form of right, I'm reminded of James Baldwin near the end of the fire next time, describing the civil rights move as a struggle for desegregation rather than integration. He uh, rather pithily notes, after all, who would want to integrate into a burning house? <laughs> so, rights require a social theoretical critique that can analyze whether the existing set of social relations do in fact cohere with their putative moral framework. That is the key. That you know, for Boggs, if you know, rights must make both a moral claim and a claim of setting up these institutions, we should be able to critique a set of social relations that continue to make a moral claim that the objective circumstances, um, the objective set of social relations necessarily and rather predictab predictably undercut. For me, rather philosophically, this is a, a problem of intelligibility. This means that if we live in such a contradictory situa um, situation, then our moral language and also our ability to understand our institutions becomes less and less intelligible. In other words, what are we even talking about at a certain point when we talk about rights? If all we're talking about is simply something we morally assent to that we know the institutions we assent to will continue to make impossible to actually um, execute and, and make realizable. For Boggs, capitalist social relations systematically undermine the contractual relationship between persons and the state by creating populations who are thoroughly dependent on and yet also absolutely abandoned by the freedom of markets. This is nothing less than a situation where one lacks no effective rights whatsoever. Boggs' concern is that without black power, rights will be reduced to a set of moral claims that have no anchor in the existing social relations. For my purposes, um, and obviously I have no time to get into this, a critical theory of utopia would demonstrate the systematic gap between a moral framework and the set of existing social relations if it is structurally necessary that the persons created by rights will find themselves effectively without them. 
But for now, um, what I'd like to describe is Boggs's theory of rights. Let me see how much time I have. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I, okay. I only have have uh, two more minutes, but I'm going to. <laughs> but I have the power here, so I'm going to go for a couple minutes over that. Uh, so this last section is called "Towards a Materialist Theory of Rights." So I think it would be helpful, and I'm looking at Boggs as the American Revolution. Um, I think it would be helpful to isolate three distinct yet interwoven trajectories in that book. First, in that book, Boggs provides a historical diagnosis whereby he seeks to explain how and why union organizations such as the CIA rose and fell. Second, he offers a historical diagnosis, which functions as stage setting for the second part of Boggs' thinking that I will call a social theoretical diagnosis. Here, Boggs provides a contemporary explanation of the social forces within capitalist society. For Boggs, these forces are the increased domination of automation and work, the naturalization of unemployment, and the reproduction of what he calls the outsiders, masses of individuals locked out of the circuit of labor and capital. Finally, Boggs situates both diagnoses within a normative framework that takes as its point of departure rights and revolution. This normative framework is essential for, for understanding Boggs' philosophical contribution to these debates, as he sought to unbind notions of right from national states under capitalism and instead make rights contiguous with changing economic forces. In other words, Boggs develops a novel notion of citizenship grounded in human well-being rather than national belonging. There are two key points that demand attention in Boggs' historical diagnosis. First, um, I'll just recap here. First, he, you know, I, as I already said, he thinks the CIO, they, they traded in the idea of wage increase rather than actual control over production, but the actual structural problem here is that it, it, it demanded that labor unions start to make a distinction between the employed and the unemployed, and so what the CIO could not see that they were doing, the, the, uh, the outcome of their actions was actually fracturing their base of power and making it so that there's intra-competition within the working class rather than solidarity. So the second, this second point follows from the first. With the loss of control over production in favor of wage increases and benefits, unions are forced to increasingly draw lines of demarcation between the unemployed and the unemployed and the employed. The ranks of the unemployed or the soon-to-be outsiders are locked out of engaging with the union and its employed workers. I think this is important because Boggs is giving his explanation for the fragmentation of working class power, the working class power base in the United States. What follows from this fragmentation is also a materialist explanation of the continuing salience of race and racism into the 1960s, where US society, given that disproportion of the unemployed who will become the outsiders, are urban blacks. So racial discrimination in and outside the labor market is not primarily explanatory, but is also not merely ideological or epiphenomenal. For Boggs, it was the CIO movement that established, quote, in the American mind for the first time, the idea of democracy on the job, established a framework within which Negroes could fight for equality inside the plant. It has done so the same for women workers, end quote. And so the fragmentation of unions was also the fragmentation of genuine democracy. To briefly summarize this social theoretical diagnosis, we can see that the rise of automation for Boggs is a symptom of the helplessness of unions that are now dependent on capitalist management. Automation exacerbates internecine conflicts within the working class as the process of production produces workers with either no memory or no connection to movements aimed at political control of production. Furthermore, the raised standard of living will sharpen the divide between those who work and those who don't, as the outsiders no longer have any place to go under the expanding dominion of capital. So to, 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 to sum up where he's going with the outsiders, those who functionally have no rights, he thinks whatever the new form of rights will be, it will have to be thought from their perspective. Boggs, he didn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a simply naive hope. He thought organizing those who are locked outside of the labor market will you know, eventually entail that they will think of rights not as being dependent on what has isolated and exploited them, but you know, will bring about a new set of social relations. This is you know, um, similar to Franz Fanon's argument 
wretch of the earth, where he thinks it's the lumpen proletariat, those you know, who have really nothing to lose but their chains, that will be the vanguard of the movement to reconstruct the world. Um, at the end of the day, what Boggs wants to say is rights, if, if for them to um, be um, harmonious, for them to actually be coherent and intelligible to us, must entail political freedom and economic freedom. And if we can say under these social relations that politics and economics is often thrown into conflict or one tends to dominate the other, then that says that we need to develop a new set of form of rights that will actually be able to take root um, you know, intelligibly in a new set of social relations. And for him, that requires overcoming capitalism and requires some form of socialism. And I'll just say really quickly, the utopian aspect of it is, Boggs thinks the, the, the horse is out of the barn when it comes to automation, and he thinks if we do this right, we could have a post-work world where all we would have to do is attend to the machines and then we could you know, work on ourselves. There's a whole lot of social theoretical reasons why actually that's not workable, but I think it, was just, it would be nice to just end on that note given how I began this talk, but thank you. <laughs> So um, thank you so much, William, for that really um, startling talk. And I mean, you, you know what I'm going to ask you, but, but I, I feel like I should preference what I'm going to ask you now okay. by, by kind of saying something, like, like hearing you present the talk as opposed to me having read the paper that most of you didn't hear the full. <laughs> it's kind of like no, no, the, the question of capitalist democracy and whether or not there's really only one right in capitalist democracy, which is the right to the market. Mm -hmm. And for black people <laughs> as who bear the history of commodity and labor, mm -hmm. but not the right to the market, mm -hmm. um, you know, that becomes a fundamental problem of how we might think about what it means to organize within and against the state. Mm -hmm. I was thinking very much as you were speaking about a moment in CLR James is, um, on the Negro question, where he's doing all of this research on lynching, and he's making the case that where black people are needed, the state is willing to intervene into lynching, where they're needed for the labor market, and where they're not needed for the labor market, lynching is allowed to run rampant. And so he really documents this through the numbers and really detailed form, and it's pretty striking you know, putting him now in conversation with your paper and Boggs, who I'm hoping you will tell us a little bit more mm -hmm. about Boggs and why you begin with his insights um, mm -hmm. and what is important about his scientificity, say vis-a-vis -vis somebody like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame mm -hmm. Torre, and Charles Hamilton, or somebody like Emir Baraka, vis-a-vis -vis what is black power. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you might want to say something about aesthetics there too. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, there's, there's a lot there. So I, I really like that you brought up C.L.R. James, so let me just say a little bit about that. You know, C.L.R. James, obviously, he was not the first African-American to look at the phenomenon of lynching. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett, you know, thoroughly documents, and she makes, you know, in, you know two incredible claims. She says, yes, there is an emotive element to, to, to lynching, you know, um, a, a racial element, racial hatred. But she also notices the people who often instigate the lynch mobs were often business owners, or workers who felt threatened by, you know, the possibility of competition with new black workers. So it was a mode of disciplining. And what she thinks is that, you know, this is actually the underside of how to create a coherent and stable labor market towards a particular economic end. I think that that's so important because I think an easy way to dismiss lynching is, oh, the, you know, that, that was the, the acts of these random, you know, wild white people. I would never. And, you know, and, you know if only we get our passion under control that wouldn't happen but she's like no there's a very rational almost scientific explanation for why this is happening what you know the, this type of force 
is meant to discipline, but also what is the situation that's creating this impassioned paranoia, anger, uh, et cetera. And that's something I was kind of hinting at when I began with talking about 700 million people. And you know, I know some people be like, no, I know people in their hearts, they want to help out. And I'm like, no amount of charity is, is going to you know, be able to overcome when people start thinking, wait a second, am I no longer able to get a job? Or is this going to affect my wages? Or I no longer recognize the country I'm living in. And you know, I just also want to say clearly what's important to get to the, the Boggs and the scientific part is, is that you know, for Boggs, if you want to talk about black power, you should not have to be you know, depending on the charity and you know, the, the souls of, 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 of other people. Why I think Boggs is actually different, you know, you know, the difference might be less with you know, um, Stokely Carmichael and Kwame Ture, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's a little more complicated with Baraka, but Boggs is specifically um, actually not interested in the aesthetic version of black power. He worries that that gives, it, gives into a type of emotionality that you know, will eventually become either two things. It'll become a type of nationalism that he just doesn't think is, is very functional or helpful, but he's also worried, and he has this essay called um, the, the myth of black capitalism. He's worried that it'll turn into, oh, as long as it's us doing it, we will be free. And so he wants to say that, no, black power is supposed to respond to a very distinct dynamic in, in, uh, in the social relations of the 1970s. What else makes it scientific? And you know, this is you know, something I, I was hoping I would get to say is that Boggs thinks that you know, um, capitalist democracy is at a particular moment of crisis where there's an opening for this type of power to announce itself, to you know, announce an evaluated framework why this form of life is not workable and what, uh, what another form of life could look like. Why was I hoping to say that? I am interested in Boggs because I see him as, you know, the way that I have in my head is a rather tragic thinker who is writing a concept for a world that actually has already passed him by. That you know, he thinks that this is a moment of potential social transformation and revolution, but you know, I won't get into the whole economic history of the 70s, but you know, they also struggled with an economic system of you know, inflation, stagnation, and actually the, the very moment of crisis was the very moment of the collapse of a lot of, of left power bases. And so I find him interesting because you know, it's like he gives us a glimpse into another form of sociality whose time, whose moment was missed. And you know, uh, for you know, the liberals in the audience, I think the same goes for John Rawls' is a theory of justice. He was writing right at a moment where the world he thought was coming into being was no longer there and available to him. So I think the fact that Boggs' program, not just Boggs's, but you know, the Boggs' program of Black Power failed is also a moment of instruction and learning for us to ask, so what is possible for us now? But also, I am, a utopian in a sense. I don't want us to be simply hemmed in by what we think is possible. So we need the resources and language to describe what else there could be. And we're not just going to be able to develop that ex nihilo. So I think the scientific scientificity is to pay attention not just to the moral claims you want to make, but the institutions that would substand and capacitate those moral claims. Oh, sorry. Right. So your, 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 your response there really, really makes me want to veer away from what I was going to ask you. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and make, make, make them bridge, which is to, like, you know, because I know you've worked on winter and, and like Boggs, but differently, I think, she's also interested um, by the mid 70s of thinking about how we might inaugurate new forms of human life. Um, new forms of social life. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, in black power discourse, there's a kind of silence on rights, but Boggs is not silent on, on rights. And then there's the kind of question of the rights in civil rights. So how might we, how might we think about the transition from civil rights to black power, the overlaps, the breaks, and how this kind of idea that circulates the right to rights is reanimated by both or not. Mm -hmm. And then it seems to me that there's a way in which, and this is why I asked you about the aesthetics of, of black power, because it seems to me that in the aesthetics of black power, there's this kind of suggestion 
that there's a right to just be, mm -hmm. um, right? This is why the need to, or the desire to return to the folk, um, to valorize and aestheticize black ways of being, not as a counter to white supremacy or not in service of a politics of respectability, mm -hmm. but in service of a politics of just being, what it means to just be. So I wonder if you want to say something about how this kind of question of rights yes. um, is trouble in the transition from one moment in black social movement, civil rights, to black power. Mm -hmm. Or are there two different social movements? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I feel like, you know, um, when I saw that question, I was like, that was, that's the question I feel that could get me in, in some trouble with what I'm going to say. Um, so first, Oh, good. Like, yeah, this, this is black power. Like, you know, this is that solidarity. Um, so first, like, you know, I love that you brought up winter because, you know, I worry I answered too hastily, you know, the aesthetics part with Boggs because, you know, um, I, I'm not like fully endorsing Boggs' position. I think he's, you know, he's a, a, a really great counterweight to much of how we imagine what rights can do. And so certainly, you know, I, I ended very, is that me? Oh, oh, no, it's okay. Like another alarm? I just got started. Um, um, uh, so what I was say, saying is, you know, um, when I ended that rather hastily with Doc Boggs' sort of post-work utopia, yeah, there is definitely, uh, there are brief aesthetic moments, like flashes of what he thinks, you know, life really could look like. And so Winter, she is also trying to, you know, remold the very conditions of how we understand ourselves to enable a new form of social activity. And so every politics, I think, has some form of aesthetics. It has some form of showing, has some form of display to it that is trying to engage our imagination imagination to move beyond. Where I think I could get in trouble, though, I think it is not an accident that forms of discourses of black power happen in the wake of the civil rights movement. And so let me say, say, add the proviso that will hopefully not let me get in trouble. I am not one of those people who's just like, oh, the civil rights movement, that was you know, a bourgeois mistake and y'all you know, need to throw out MLK and you know, get on with you know, such and such. No, no, I think that that was an incredible accomplishment of what they did, of, you know, um, of being able to see a moment and get the state to do something. But you know what Boggs is, is going to see see there is and I do not think he's one of those people who's just like, you know, well that civil rights movement, that was, you know, that was empty, that was hollow. Instead what he thinks is that was you know, an important learning moment where you know what is happening there was an attempt to get the state to live up to its own form, to, in other words, integrate further into the state. And I, I'm not like moralistic about this. Like, you know, it is important that you have the right to vote. It's important that you can walk down the street and, you know, not be harassed. Absolutely. But there are also limits. And the limits that they saw was that they realized we are now formally integrated, yet we still do not have the capacity or power to determine our lives, to just be. The police still harass us you know, uh, in the city. I am still finding myself without a job. Um, I am still finding that even when people who look like me, and this is really important for this moment, even when people who look like me become mayors, now they're calling the police on people who look like me. But I thought you were the bearer of our dreams. You use this discourse of, you know, we are here being the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of, you know, uh, somewhere in Indiana, the mayor of Chicago, we're black and, you know, we're all in this together. And then as soon as, you know, people start getting upset and, you know, um, demanding more and engaging in rambunctious protests, the first to call the police, the first you know, to protect property. And so I think you know, for, for, for Boggs, what he realized, and I, I, I do like this notion that, that you have of you know, just being, realized that this form of integration, that still wasn't you know, the, um, the attainment of someplace where we could just be. It was still living as, living analogous to what is required of us in this system. And so when I even think of the mayors, you know, again, you know, me, I, I, I'm really hard on black people in power. I try, I, I try to be nice, but you know, um, it's not moralistic. But, you know, because for me, those mayors, I imagine maybe they thought that they were going to do something else when they ran and when they got there. And then you start learning about, oh, it turns out if you pursue particular radical policies to redistribute wealth, all of a sudden capital is like, that's okay. 
we can invest elsewhere. And you start getting calls saying, you know, we're going to decimate that power base. Good luck getting elected. And so those objective limitations, I think, it was a wake up call and realized we were free in one sense insofar as there's not literally the policy is separate but equal, but we can, we're can we still not able to be left alone because all of these other forces are still impacting our lives, still uh, constraining the choices we can make, and even still constraining it so that we are freely cho choosing to be in the system that constrains the choices we can make. Yeah, your, your response there really made me start to think, starting thinking about Saidiya Hartman's um, insistence that um, emancipation was a non-event. And, and, and I, I take that to my own work then to try to think about this notion of black people being in the long emancipation and the civil rights and black power are iterations of the struggle to be emancipated, to meet freedom. And, um, and the kind of, you know, the, the freedom is this thing that's always somehow ahead of us. And I, I think in your paper you were hinting at that too and pushing at that, that there's, and so, you know, like rights often get administered as if freedom, mm -hmm. you know, by the state. And, um, and, and it seems to me that that logic poses a significant problem both retrospectively, because then we're supposed to be supposed to be free a long time ago, <laughs> but we're not free now, right? Exactly. So, it's like, but it also poses the kind of present, future-oriented problem because we know we're not free in a certain kind of way. I was thinking that, that also then, because rights gets used as this synonym for freedom, that um, th these rights also become obviously deeply individualized, even though they're struggled for collectively, mm -hmm. and. Um, so I wonder if you say something about what forms of sociality do these rights produce for black political community in particular? And how does the individuating nature of capital share and structure the distribution of these rights? Mm -hmm. So how does capital, because a lot of the work that you're doing with Boggs is about the profound critique of capital um, and, and, the, and the critique of capital in which the distribution of rights are much about buttressing the perpetuation of capital as opposed to providing the ground from which people can live the kind of, can 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 conceive of and live the kind of lives that they would want to live. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So when I begin with the example of of George Floyd and you know saying one might say justice was done because I, I believe you know I, I guess his name doesn't matter but I guess his name is Derek Chauvin I, I believe he was he was one Derek Chauvin definitely one of the ones who did the violence to black people and you know and and so it can seem as if justice was done to George Floyd and you know I rather pithily say well you know that doesn't restore George Floyd's life but I I if I was speaking more clearly Clearly, you know, what I would really want to say is that, you know, if you think of rights as only individually, then you could say in some sort of way justice was done for George Floyd because in that individual case, that individual police officer, you know, was punished. What did not happen was a reorganization of the of the social groups at play. You know, those who are are urban, those who are poor, those who are not police, and the institution of police. In fact, from what I read, you know, in 2021, police budgets were higher than ever. And so I, you know, I was told that that was a watershed moment. You know, the good days are coming now, and in terms of you just have to wait the protests out. And so for Boggs. Individuals can lay a claim to right, but they are socially guaranteed. And for him, when we forget that you know the individual may make the claim for a right, but they are they are born by social groups, they are born socially. What we miss is that you know we don't have power independent of those with whom we are cooperating with, with those with whom we work. But also, I didn't get to read the part of the paper where I talk about rights as both conflictual and, and con you know constitutional. That rights can create oh, a sense of a we. We are demanding this, we are do this. But also rights can be, be sites of, you know, you know, 
you are not allowed access to this. And you know, he uses the example of the American Revolution that you know, it can seem like this was a moment of universal rights, but as we know, you know um, if you weren't you know, a, a rich planter, you weren't considered one of the true like, you know, rights-bearing creatures. And so that there was a conflict there of trying to separate who is due rights and who, who is not. And so what I think is important to the, the sociality is that you know, he doesn't give up in the language of rights because he thinks Rights can help you know, allow groups to constitute themselves as subjects who deem themselves worthy of recognition, equality, and respect. But also, on the more social theoretical line, without social power, without a group that is you know, that has institutions that's coherent enough, intelligible in, enough in itself to have the capacity to defend those rights, then those rights are already quite precarious. And so he actually thinks he can mobilize this language of rights, what in the paper I call the Janus face nature of rights. You know, he can mobilize them to create a new form of sociality that doesn't see you know, this horizon of capitalist democracy as the only horizon. But he also understands that so much of rights discourse is about convincing you know, people this is the only world that's possible. And so it's better, better you integrate rather than be, be left outside of it. And that can have, you know, that can have the effect of you know, um, heightening the, the, the tensions of competition and dissolving a notion of acting as a we that understands you know, itself as you know, being able to make possible for individuals to be to lay claim to rights. And so this isn't simply a technical political argument he's making. He thinks that a new form of social life could become possible by mobilizing the language of rights, realizing, showing how they don't function under these circumstances, but you know, giving us a glimpse of what it would mean to cooperate together in the struggle for rights in a new set of, uh, of social life that would have new institutions and maybe even you know, new frameworks of how we address ourselves to one another. Maybe we'll open it up to the audience for questions now. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get off easy? I don't think so. If not, I, I, I have more questions. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm under, oh, just sure. Hmm. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering why if there's a contradiction in the form of right as we know it, like why think, I mean, why try to preserve the category at all? And I guess I'm wondering like, so there's like, you know, there's like, cause there's kind of like a, a standard Marxist line that the, it's just like the category of right itself is not going to be sufficient for realizing our social freedom or building the institutions. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess it sounds to me, though, that and this is what was coming out in the end, that there is this kind of actually like generative possibility in the category of right because there's something inherently collective or collectivizing about it. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on like whether you think, and maybe you can speak in your own voice here, Okay. whether you think utopia should be conceived in the category of right. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll speak in my my own voice, but you know, I I do also want to speak a little bit in Boggs' voice of why I think he he sticks with the language of rights. So I'll do my Boggs persona, and then I'll say what what I think. <laughs> you know, so you, you get a twofer with this question. Um, so I think 
you know, Boggs holds on to the, the, you know, the language of rights because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't think that rights are actually reducible to the state. For him, he thinks, you know, rights are an effect of the, the social activity, the struggle of groups to stake a claim on how, how they think that they ought to be treated in social life, you know, how, and also to stake a claim about the type of responsibilities that they think we ought to have to one another. And so for him, he thinks that, you know, to simply do away with the language of rights, I think someone like Boggs would be thinking, well, we still need a language of talking about sociality. And there's no reason to think that we cannot mobilize this language of right against the context that it's, it's been found in, because we look at history and that's been done before. That's why, he, you know, he calls, you know, his book rather um, ironically, I guess, The American Revolution. He's, he's saying, so there was a bourgeois revolution, which was truly a revolution. It was truly a restructuring of social relations. It wasn't full emancipation. It wasn't full freedom. And so for Boggs, he's saying there's no reason to think that we cannot do that ourselves, that we ourselves cannot be the, the revolutionary ferment. Now, again, you know, having you know, 50 years experience, we can say, well, Boggs, it, it looks like you bet wrong, but I sometimes think that that's an unjust way to, to deal with the, th the thinking of philosophers. Um, and so I think that's what he's saying. For me, um, even though I work on utopia, I am, I'm worried about simply you know, gesturing toward abstract novelty. You know, um, th so the, the easy critiques of utopia, whether it's Marxist, whether it's left, whether it's right, whether it's central, everyone comes for utopia. I, I pick the side of losers. I can't help it. I'm an underdog that way. Is that, oh, it's all about just, you know, abstract imagination, but, you know, it acts as if, you know, the human creature can just, you know, be, you know, self-creating, self-generating, um, and that, you know, it can just simply create some new language that has nothing to do with, you know, um, the world that we have now. I think that that's, that's you know, um, again, I'm going to be on record, I think that's a terrible reading of utopia. That's not how it's been mobilized historically, but it great, makes great polemics. And so for me, I think, you know, what's important about a critical theory of utopia is that it can, you know, um, discern, um, disclose um, potential um, avenues, potential strategies uh, in our existing language and in, in existing institutions that we can use to move out of this context. So this means that, you know, just because, you know, we are trapped in this really terrible state of affairs is about seeing what resources we can draw that can we can transpose into a new new context. And so, you know, um, I, I think that there is something really powerful in Bog saying, I know you mean this thing by rights, but we mean something else. And when you see the, you know, the, the presuppositions, the world that we're building into this notion uh, of rights, he thinks that is the essence of a real political and salient conflict. So this means that whatever utopia is, is not something simply absolutely disconnected from our social context, but it's also not immersed in it. It's not, you know, absolutely determined by it. And, you know, it opens the way for a revitalization of the, the practices and the languages that we use to talk and communicate to one another. And it means that it's not so completely alien that no one could possibly want to fight for because they wouldn't even be able to recognize it as, you know, um, harmonizing or speaking to any of their, their desires. You know, I'm certainly not here to, like, be like a, to describe a completely alien world and somehow persuade you that's the world you should fight for. I think maybe um, I don't even see myself in that world. Why would I fight for it? But if you can disinter the language that is often used to bind you, to you know, show that you know it is not a natural fact. It's you know the product of your know, relations of power and constraint. And once you see where those relations of power and constraint are, and start attacking them, moving around them, then you find new breathing room. And also, I think it's important for people to be able to believe that they are able to do something to bring about a freer social existence. So that would be my response to, I guess the Marxists would be like, oh, ho, ho, still <laughs> trapped in bourgeois, right? And, you know, uh, I'm not saying you're doing that, by the way, I'm sorry. Uh, but that would be my response. I would you know, want, want to say, we have to make use of how people are, where they are, and be able to mobilize our critique on, on, on that ground, rather than simply appealing to some abstract other world.
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, mean, I almost regret telling y'all about that, but you know, <laughs> fair enough, go for it. <laughs> There's, there's more to life than, than to clean the machines, but I got you. <laughs> so, um, do, I guess, do rights um, exist in a, in a kind of discernible form in that kind of society? So one of the sort of motivations for my question is thinking that in sort of society as we've known it so far, um, we've known essentially class struggles and sort of imposed forms of scarcity. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's especially the case in capitalism. So when we think about um, a right being like a right to exclude others, you know, um, that's something that's imposed by this form of society. So in the next form of society, is there sort of a right that exists differently than the sort of, I guess we could say, kind of the one that must be defended? Mm -hmm. um, is there a right that need not be defended? Or yeah, so uh, that, you know, Here's what, here's what I will say. I am speaking as myself, and I'm not sure if this would be Boggs' position, but you know, you know, the claim of creating or instituting, bringing about a new set of social relations is not the same as claiming that you know, um, humanity will become perfect, there will be no conflicts, no disagreements. The, the substance and the foundations and the, um, the objective constraints on those disagreements will be radically modified. But I think for Boggs, he wants to hang onto the language of rights because he, w he does think that will there will still be the necessity for institutions that stabilize how we are supposed to treat one another, how we are supposed to regard one another. That, you know, this is not account an account of somehow how, you know, humanity becomes almost, you know, godlike and saintly. You know, this is really about how objective social relations create, you know, um, or encourage particular types of behavior, um, you know, create particular types of frames of understanding behavior. But there should still be, and I think, you know, whatever this free society, you know, this freer society will be, um, you know, go along with what Ronaldo was saying, if it's about the freedom to be, then people should be able to be how they actually choose to be. But we'll never be able to escape being in soci sociality with one another. So there will have to be some sort of standardized way of understanding what our relations are. And so I would worry by saying, you know, uh, you know let's use the whole automation frees us. Um, I do want to say something in favor of that right after this. Automation frees us from the domination of the wage contract. You know, uh, one who is skeptical would say, yeah, but um, people can still be awful after that, people can still engage in antisocial behavior. And I see nothing Boggs that says that he thinks that that would just stop. And so, you know, rights would still be a, an understanding of what it means to be able to just be, but under conditions where we are not dependent on these, um, in, you know, the impersonal social dynamics of the economy. That's why I, I don't think, you know, I guess I'm not one of the people who thinks that, you know, we need to completely throw out morality or some notion of ethical life that we share, I think at that point you're talking about something rather inhuman and wouldn't recognize it. Um, the the, the, the post-work thing, you know, uh, I, yeah, leaving it at that is just like, oh, okay, Boggs, well, you know, you're just jumping down deep, deep in. But there's a social theoretical reason for it. It's because Boggs thinks that domination, you know, is internal to the wage structure. And so he's trying to articulate what it would mean to cut the legs out from under that form of domination. Who would think we'd have to be released from needing the wage in order to survive. Now, of course, how he frames it is this idea of we check in on the machines, like, okay, so things are all good, and then we flourish and all of that. But I think, you know, there, um, and this um, argument isn't, um, isn't mine, but, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting his name. His, his first name is Alex. Alex Gorvich. Okay, if you're watching, I remembered. Um, uh, Alex Gorvich, you know, he makes this argument that, you know, there will still be socially necessary labor 
in, in some form. But just because something's socially necessary doesn't mean it's unfree. There's a difference between, you know, being compelled by a kind of alien force that, you know, deprives you uh, uh, of you know, making yourself intelligible and your world intelligible and doing that type of work than, you know, being able to see, oh, this is something that we must do. And understanding why you're doing it and being able to appropriate the ends of that work and choose where it's going. And so one would worry something like, you know, say the United States achieves post-work and just exports all the labor to those parts of the world outside the United States. That doesn't sound like the world that Boggs is struggling for. And in fact, it's not. In the American Revolution, you know, his idea is, you know, honestly, the position of those of us in the States should be allow other you know, social struggles to figure out their way of you know, becoming free and whether it's South America or you know, the African continent, it's not up to us to dictate to them how they should struggle. But you know, he tends to think rather optimistically, but we're all gonna converge in the same place. And that I have a harder time defending, um, but I see, I see his reasoning behind it. He thinks, you know, of course, this is where we are tending to if we understand freedom appropriately, intelligibly. I hope that answers your question. Question from the audience, uh, live stream audience. From Kwesi Thomas, how does Bog's critic of rights relate to Isaiah Berlin's distinct, distinction between positive and negative liberty? Uh, I mean, I did, I, I did ask for that, didn't I? <laughs> Um, I think for, for Boggs, that framing of freedom is completely inadequate. I think, you know, for the reason why I began with this idea of it turns out rights are disempowerment from rather than empowerment to, you know, I think for, for Boggs, the new set of social relations wouldn't be something like, and now we have positive freedom rather than negative freedom. For him, it would be actually freedom becomes a, a coherent social concept where I am all together, yes, I am free from, you know, alien forces imposing them upon my conduct, and that does enable me to engage in positive projects. But carving the world up like that, as if, you know, so there are rights that are positive and there are rights that are negative, I think, you know, for Boggs, he thinks that that, you know, emanates from a particular social context of understanding rights as either privative or rights as either, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the individual's capacity to do something. And so I think for him, the, even the concept of freedom would be altered, you know, under a set of social conditions where carving the joints in that way would not be necessary. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, another question. Are rights only possible for bugs in a kind of radical democracy in the sense Dubois speaks about in all spheres of social life, in the sense that anything else signifies a lack of power? So what's, um, what's important for, for Boggs is he doesn't think that rights have not existed up until now. He thinks that particular classes have had the power to have rights. And so for him, he is asking the question of if rights are supposed to have some sort of universal element to, to them, what are the, the social conditions that would, be, that would have to obtain for that to actually be the case? What are the social conditions that would have to obtain where there is not systematic conflict between groups of those who claim the um, rights at the expense of others and you know, who claim their right to um, property or to investment against you know, others' right to have access to, you know, housing, food, and wages. And so, you know, I, I like the connection to, you know, Du Bois and Black Reconstruction is, you know, Du Bois, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan, but I will also say, of course, there are limitations, but, you know, for him, he's looking at this history and he's saying, you know, we get a glimpse of what the universal would require in the moment that we see how the, the social relations of property, 
cultural relations and political relations would have to be radically revised from the ground up. And so I think Joe Boggs' idea is something along the lines of if you truly think rights are, are universal, if you truly think that they obtain for all social groups, then you need to ask yourself what institutions you know, would be necessary to make that. I, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you. I know, I guess I should be looking at the camera. <laughs> Hi. Um, what institutions would be necessary for that to actually be the case? And then that should bring into view, this is the critical, a critical aspect of it, well, what institutions do we have now globally that actually make it so that some don't have rights? And I'm thinking of economic institutions like you know, the IMF. I'm thinking of you know, the border policies of the EU. You know, that what is entailed here is that you know, um, external powers can dictate how other states you know, run their economies, their policies, et cetera. And so if the rights that you think you are defending is universal, you're trying to make them intelligible on the basis of those institutions, at least Boggs would say you should see that that's an impossibility. And so I actually think that for Boggs, the consequences are wide ranging. Like once you start going down this path and really asking where the power is in this world, then you start asking not just questions of what can I get from the state, you start asking why is it so hard that even when the state tries to do policies of redistribution, you know, markets punish them. And then you know, they have to pull back and you know, say, oh, it's time for fiscal responsibility. Um, this is a little bit uh, off topic, but it's my favorite joke. You know, Liz Truss, she tried to do something radical and you know, people are like, when are we gonna get a general election and all of that? And you know, I look at that as the markets were tanking and disciplining, it was a general election every day for the markets. And you know, when you put it in that way, Boggs, if he were still alive, he would say, what power do you have when it turns out these anonymous social forces, and I'm not a fan of Liz Truss's policies, by the way, <laughs> but what power do you have when these anonymous social forces can say no? And so then what are rights worth if that is really what obtains in this world? And that's why I, again, began with 700 million people. You're going to find out how hollow this discourse of rights is under these particular conditions. Maybe I'll be wrong and humanity is much better than I think, but I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> yes. Correct. My question is, I was intrigued when you were talk, uh, doing the talk, you said uh, that Box is pushing us to rethink rights from the perspective of the outsider. Yes. Um, and if that's the case, then I'm wondering that if that's a move to then relocate rights again on the human, and then we risk kind of having a similar conception of rights as natural rights, or mm. is rethinking rights from the outsider um, different from what I'm suggesting? When he tries to, you know, th when he argues that we should rethink rights from the place of the outsider, he's not saying because the outsiders naturally have some rights. In fact, you know, um, I didn't say the really controversial part of my talk, and I, I won't repeat it here, but I talk about Dred Scott in the Supreme Court decision that, you know, the, um, the black man has no right, rights that the white man is bound to respect. Oh, I guess I'm already saying it. But, and, and so allow me to explain, but I say, no, um, you know, on Boggs' interpretation, um, uh, I think his name was um, Justice Taney, he was correct. And that is because for, for Boggs, rights aren't first, you know, um, a sort of a, a moral characteristic of the human being. Rights for him, you know, are in the political sphere of struggle. So I think sometimes we think of rights as they're the guardrails for politics. They tell us, you know, what are the red lines we, we cannot cross. So when he's looking at it from the perspective of, of, of the outsider, he is actually asking not what rights they are naturally do, but, you know, what would they, what would be required for us to be able to say that they have rights. And for him, he thinks that rights are effectuated in the midst of social struggles. Yes, sometimes the language uh, in social movements will say, you know, these are our God-given rights, you know, um, these are our rights due by, by us by nature. But, you know, Boggs is, you know, he is like laser focused on what makes a right effective. And what makes it effective is not some idea that inheres in, you know, the, the, the substance of humanity. Instead, what he wants to say is, given that the, the outsider necessarily structurally cannot be integrated into the social order, what they would demand once they were organized 
is a complete radical revision of a social order and the rights that, that would attend that social order. And so for him, he thinks that it's a perspective, you know, it's from their perspective that we can see um, the, the emptiness, the vacuity of our, our rights talk and, you know, and to hopefully encourage and work alongside their, uh, their efforts at self-emancipation to create rights, to go back to you know, his rather pithy phrase, rights are what you make and what you take. And so I think that, that that is important because, you know, then you could get this sort of romantic thing of, you know, of like, you know, oh, you know, why, you know, they have rights. Why don't we treat them with dignity? And, you know, Boggs would worry that that turns into making them objects of pity, objects of charity, rather than understanding that, no, if they are going to have rights, it will have to be due to their efforts. It will have to be due to their political struggle. And that's what will make a right effective not before the political struggle. I, I think we've come to the end. Oh. <laughs> Here, we're at 5.30. So join me again in um, thanking Professor Paris for a wonderful talk and for the most beautiful engagement with our questions and queries. Thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great